Welcome back, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, who's uh, Pavel. And he's a developer who's having tons of fun writing Haskell, yet he's at the Scala Love Conference. Um, he also enjoys learning about distributed algorithm, uh, the joy and uh, loves he will try to share during today's presentation. So, uh, a round of applause. Please welcome Pavel. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, even though I write Haskell right now, I've been writing Scala for a long time. But I've cheated because the talk I'm going to present here is not actually about Scala, but it's something I think every developer should be aware of. So let me, without further ado, share my slides if that is possible. So the question is, can you see them? Yes, all good. All right. It's all possible right. to share your slides, even though they're called impossibility. <laughs> yes, so it is possible. It is possible that you see them. All right, so welcome. I have, I think, 45 minutes to talk about something that is, uh, uh, well, it's been with me for a very long time. It's something that I've been interested for a very long time and researching a bit, even though I have no formal qualification whatsoever. So. When you, when you read a slide like that, impossibility in the area of distributed computing, um, for many of you, this might bring one particular finding, one particular proof uh, or paper that is somewhat well known. But as it turns out, in the area of distributed computing, there are thousands, thousands, oh, not thousands, hundreds of impossibility proofs. So Nancy Lynch in 1989 tried to sort of gather all impossibility proofs in the realm of distributed algorithms. And she kind of stopped on the, num on the number 100 because that task was already exhausted. Uh, she said her, her search wasn't even exhaustive or systematic. But as you can see, there are a lot of things that are impossible in the distributed computing. The thing we're going to be focusing on uh, in this presentation is one particular broad fundamental problem, and that is a problem of consensus. So in other words, reaching agreement uh, within uh, remote processes and the dis distributed system. So I, I consider a fundamental problem. Now, when we read the literature about distributed systems, and a consensus problem, uh, they will sometimes mention a notion that it originated as a problem within like transa um, distributed transaction commit. So we can imagine uh, transac uh, transaction managers trying to figure out whether a given transaction should be committed or not. Other lit literature mentions a different problem which speaks better to my imagination, and that is a problem of replicated state machine. Um, the replicated state machines was probably mentioned in other papers, but one I really like enjoyed reading was uh, Leslie Lampert's Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in Distributed System, uh, where Leslie Lampert actually provides a definition of replicated state machine. So if you imagine a state machine being a, an abstract, which holds a possible set of some events E, and possible states in which it can be. If you throw at that state machine some event, and that machine is in some particular uh, state S, it can transition to a new state by applying existing current state and the event that was just thrown at it. So the execution of such a machine is just a transition between one state to another and the thing that triggers that execution are upcoming events. So we can imagine a node that has internal state, some client connects to it, sends it a message. So that sends it in some sort of an event. That event is applied to the current state, which gives us a new state, which is then held within that node. Or you can, you can potentially have a persisted queue in that node. So once that event was um, properly uh, transitioned through the state machine, you can store that event. So then if you're 
node dice or whatever, you can always reproduce given state by just by just traversing that uh, persisted queue of events. Now this is a state machine, so the problem is straightforward and I guess clear. Uh, the issue arises when you try to replicate those machines, when you try to keep a coherent, consistent state machine that is distributed over network. So for whatever reason that may be, uh, being a, some sort of availability in your system, you replicate number of nodes, but you want all of those nodes having the exact same queues of events at the exact same time, so they all have the exact same state. So you can imagine different clients connecting to different nodes. Here, for example, node one might be saying, hey, I got this event from client one, should I persist it in my queue? Why the node three might be saying, dude, I don't even know who the client one is. And yeah, what now? So the idea here is that they might, all those nodes might have some agreement protocol, some way of determining whether which event should be, should go through that transition function next. Interestingly, in that paper, Time Clocks and Ordering of Events of Distributed Systems, Leslie Lamport introduces an algorithm that is, shouldn't really be considered as consensus protocol. It, it introduces an algorithm that allows us to reach those nodes, reach an agreement of how those events should be ordered. And in that order, they are then being transitioned through that state machine which is a nice little trick and it's, it works. It actually works, but as long as your nodes will not fail. If any of those nodes dies, the algorithm that is described at the very end of this paper uh, will not work correctly. If anything, it will most likely uh, halt. So now what? Well, 20 years later, Leslie Lamport publishes this paper called The Part-Time Parliament about a consensus algorithm called Paxos. Now, the problem with that paper was that nobody understood it. Uh, Leslie Lamport did a lot of effort advertising it, going from university to university, wearing things, you know, like Indiana Jones hat and whip and acting as a horologist who just found this this uh, this paper about this ancient civilization that was reaching a consensus in the parliament, but nobody understood it. Lampert got frustrated. He was at the conference in 2001. People were keep, keep on telling him how Paxos was difficult. He was convinced that Paxos is really, really simple. So he cornered some people. <laughs> He's like, like, you, you and you go with me. He explained them the algorithm on a piece of paper, which... Uh, later became an official paper called Paxos Made Simple. Um, all right, so what we can actually read from that paper? Well, we can read that Paxos is an algorithm that allows us to achieve consensus among distributed computers in an asynchronous, asynchronous network, which, which sounds bold. Like, this is, this is awesome. It means that the replicated state machine that I just been mentioning a moment ago is possibly we can possibly implement it, uh, having an agreement implemented with that consensus algorithm. All right, so, so this algorithm apparently works when nodes communicate with messages, the messages can arrive at arbitrary speed, uh, the uh, agents, the processes that um, do the computation can run at arbitrary speed, they might fail, they might restart, um, and uh, it, the messages can be duplicated, the messages can be lost, uh, things cannot be corrupted, but other than that, everything can go south, and apparently the Paxos algorithm will work. Now, when I learned about this algorithm, that was around 12 years ago, I remember I attended this workshop about even sourcing, and then we stayed late with with Greg Young. So here, the, the person on the left is a Greg Young. So my, myself and two of my friends, Marek Dudek, Dudek and uh, Bartek Kaflowski, and we were supposed to stay for one beer, 
But six hours later, I remember being completely intoxicated, uh, learning about distributed algorithms, Paxos, this. One of those, I mean, everyone, I guess, has this moment in their professional life when their career is shifting. Uh, my happened that night, unfortunately, being uh, wasted. Nevertheless, my mind was blown up. You know, like I was, I literally was not understanding what's going on, obviously, but the ideas seem so awesome. And I, I set myself on a crusade to eventually learn how Paxos works. Uh, and immediately the next day, but I failed <laughs> because of the algorithm was so complicated. Nevertheless, uh, year after year, I was coming back to this algorithm. And when I was really hoping I finally grasped the idea that I finally understood after so many attempts to write, read this paper, what Leslie Lampert actually meant, I found this. So this is a paper called Impossibility of Distributed Consensus with One Faulty Process. And it's saying that is, it is impossible to achieve consensus in a synchronous uh, network where even a single process may die, even if messages are reliable. And I look at it and I was like, what? Wait, what? Because I just learned about Paxos, which is supposed to work in a synchronous network where things might be even more complicated, where yeah, they also work by sending messages, but and they may fail. And messages can take arbitrarily long time, can be duplicated and even lost. But here, they are saying that in a synchronous model, when they only need to reach a consensus on a one binary value, so either zero or one, such a protocol is impossible to be implemented. Uh, and that implies even to a very weak problem where they prove that it will not only work for like full consensus. Even if you try to implement consensus that's supposed to, in which only few processes were supposed to reach an agreement, this will not work as well. And I was like, what the hell? Did I just waste it? Maybe that meeting and that beer was actually a dream. What's going on? And as obviously as always, the, the devil lies in the details. So the idea behind this presentation is to look at those details, unravel the problem, the theorem, and then maybe coming back, come back to, to this original question that I have, how can we apply those results from this paper to a real world? Okay, so let's first talk about the consensus in that paper um, that they are trying, they were trying to find a solution for. So the, originally they were looking for how many nodes might fail in order for some algorithm to reach a consens consensus in unsynchronous network. Uh, they started with a very weak form of consensus problem. So they said like, hey, we only want to decide either a binary value, either zero or one. And we like not even all nodes need to, uh, need to reach that conclusion. If some processes eventually make a decision, we're good. So that's very weak form of a consensus problem. Um, and they also mentioned that some processes may fail but those that will not fail have to choose the same value. Uh, and they ruled out the obvious like trivial solution where everybody says like zero, right? Uh, so they ruled out by saying both zero and one are possible decision values. Okay, having said that, let's talk about, let's talk about the model they use. We've mentioned that it's a asynchronous model. So it's asynchronous in both the computation and message processing. What does it mean? This is asynchronous in computation. So processes are running asynchronously and we know nothing about the speed of how, of, of the relative speed of each of the, of the processes. They might calculate things fast, slow, long, very long, not infinitely long, but so, so, so they will make a decision, they make a next step at some point, 
but we know nothing about it. It's an arbitrary value. And given that, we have no way of telling if the process is dead or it still is running very, very, very slow. Also, the asynchronous model applies to massive delivery. So we can take no assumptions about how long it will take for the message to deliver. Um, so every message is eventually delivered. So there are some fairness properties on the, the, the delivery system, but it may take an infinitely many attempts to receive it as long as, uh, as, long as at, at some point it will be received. However, as I said, messages can be late and can arrive out of order. So that's some strong assumptions, but there's also others which are, I guess, weaker. So there is, message system is thought of to be reliable. So that means that if message is being sent, it will be delivered correctly and exactly once. And also an atomic broadcast is assumed. So it means that a process sent one message to a bunch of other processes. If at least one of those processes, non-faulty processes receive that message, all of them will. So even with those assumptions about the message system, in that particular model, when the processes may fail, consensus cannot be reached. As it turns for the, when we talk about failures that are in distributed systems um, literature, there are different um, types of failures that the node may have. Like the most extreme, I guess, will be Byzantine failures, where not only the node may fail, but it may also act arbitrary, even malicious, right? We can consider a node that just not uh, keeping itself consistent to the protocol, but actually acts as an evil process that tries to do evil things. And uh, authors of the paper, they, they realized that, hey, we know that there is no, pro that obviously every protocol be, can be overwhelmed with this tremendous amount of faults, but could we at least prove that it's possible to achieve a consensus with one? Now, the problem <laughs> with me have, like presenting this slides over uh, remotely over Zoom is that normally when I'm at the conference, I can see the reaction of people, like if they're falling asleep, if they're watching Twitter, if they maybe just switch uh, slides and they're watching something completely uh, irrelevant to what I'm speaking. So it's hard for me to present this presentation right now because there no, there's no way for me knowing uh, if you're even listening. And, uh, and I've been doing remote work for a very long time. Uh, people who haven't probably were exposed to rework, remote, remote work very recently. We know it's hard. And we, and we know it's really hard to keep on focus, but maybe if you can keep with me for another 30 minutes, we might actually find something really, really fun. So please stay with me. I know it's Saturday and I will be showing a tremendous amount of quotes from papers. But uh, the nice thing about it is the next time you're gonna go from some interview for some blockchain company or whatever, you might actually nail it when they, when they ask you about the impossibility theorems in the distributed systems. Anyway, this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to understand whether a, whether, why they mentioned that the, it's impossible for a synchronous system to reach a consensus when one of the nodes might die. The last thing that we need is a formalism. Why do we need a formalism? Well, if you look at the literature, even if you look at the Paxos Made Simple paper, a lot of authors, um, they bring some, um, some findings, but they find it difficult to rigorously prove that those findings are correct. They might give us an intuitive um, understanding of how the, how the algorithm could work. And we might feel that, yeah, this is probably right. But until we don't have, until we have a, a, a formal way of defining the problem, 
and the solution, we don't really know. So, so the idea in the paper um, is, uh, is an ability to simulate a distributed system as a uh, sequence of steps. And you might be thinking like, what? How is that even possible? Well, so just to give you a, 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 a quick example of visualization of how that might work, imagine a simple sequential program that goes from state init to running and then it stops. It's easy to show uh, a graph representing how the program will work. Now, if that program was a single thread, a single process running concurrently with other processes which work exactly like that, we can still present uh, the possible executions of that program in the, in the sequence of uh, computation steps. So, in, so, for example, if we run two of those processes together in parallel, the example representation would look like this. So each step in that transition graph represents all the possible values that each of the threads, each of the processes had at the given moment of time. So they both start with init, and then one of them goes running either P1 or P2, and then another one goes running, and so on and so forth until they finally reach a stopped um, value. Now, each of those states, in this paper, uh, there is a very um, distinguished and important concept of configuration. So in intuitively, each of those states here in this graph can be thought of as configuration of the system. So it's like a snapshot of how the system looks like in particular moment in time. And we can obviously imagine the more possible states and more processes running in parallel, the graph becomes more and more complicated until it's just too complex to even put on the screen. So in the paper, impossibility of distributed, distributed consensus with one faulty process, that's a very, very long title. That's why in, sometimes you will find this paper being referenced as FLP for the first letters of Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson, the authors of the paper. So they are saying that the processes are modeled as automata. Now, the issue with that statement is that they don't really necessarily say what that is. They, they spent maybe a paragraph on that, but automata was actually um, formalized two years later in, I think it was a master's, master's thesis uh, by Nancy Lynch and uh, Mark Tuttle but they defined the concept of IO automaton. And that IO automaton in that paper, they mentioned that this is exactly what in the FLP paper uh, describes. So we can go back a bit, a bit to the future, maybe graphic understanding of what that IO automaton is, and then we can, can go back to FLP paper. So automaton has a single thing, a transition function. So automaton is defined by transition function, which is fully deterministic. It takes an event, changes the state, and produces some output action. So automaton can have input actions and output actions. And input actions are always enabled, so you can always call an action of automaton, which triggers an event, which triggers transition function, which may or may not trigger the output function. Um, so input is always enabled, output uh, action is sometimes enabled. We can have you know, more than one input action, we can have more than one output action. The nice thing about automaton, so the automaton is an abstraction that allows us to reason about models, about formalism of distributed systems. And the nice thing about it is that it's fully composable. So if I have two automatons, one describes, formally describes some subset of my problem, and the other one describes a different subset of my problem, I can compose them where the output action of one automaton becomes an input action of the second. And then I get a more complicated automaton out of that composition. So in that paper, the FLP paper, we read that the processes are modeled, modeled as automata, uh, which communicate, so in the, and they, the processes communicate over messages which are delivered throughout the network. 
So we need to formalize two things. We need to formalize processes and we need to formalize the network itself. And once we have the formalism for those two, we can combine them together and then we can formalize the whole system, the whole protocol in one nice, uh, concise way. Um, so the way that the processes are modeled are modeled as a, um, um, a, a uh, automaton where there is a single input, they call it a register, but that's the input action, they call it X. There's a transition function, which as you remember is uh, fully deterministic and um, process can hold itself some, its own internal state. And it has a single output register or output action called Y. Now Y can give you two values, zero or ones. And once, and initially Y has a value B, you can think of it as a null. So once a value is outputted by a process, it means that that particular process made a decision. So one, once Y goes from B, so a null value to zero or one, it can never go back. This is like write only one's ability for a process. And that means a process made a decision. We also need to model a network. How are we gonna do that? Well, the net network is modeled with a concept of a message buffer. So a message is a pair of process and some, and some message value from some set of possible values. That tuple is being stored internally in that, um, uh, in, in some queue. And we have, on that automaton, we have two actions that can be triggered, send or receive. Process my send a message, it means it takes that tuple a PNM, so P is a receiver of a given message, and it's being stored internally in that message buffer. And the process might call an action receive, which act, asks, hey, give me another message. Now, there's a important concept about the ability of sending and receiving. So as, you know, as I said, send places the message on the message buffer, receives retrieves that message, but it has a special marker called zero. And that means that, hey, there is no message for you. So a process might call a message buffer, hello, give me, give me a uh, message, please. And even if that message actually exists in the message buffer, it might not be delivered. So here, the idea is we simulate uh, the ability of mess of the network delaying the messages being received. We simulate a message being sent from China to United States, this way or the other. So, so now having that, um, this is pretty, pretty much what I just said. Um, we can think of the whole system as a composition between all the processes, their input and output actions, and the message buffer. I tried to draw arrows, but then this picture became just arrows and nothing else. But you can imagine the way, the way this whole formalism works is that, sorry, is that the, uh, we start with processes, they have some initial values set to X, so X might be zero or one, and they're like, hey, I'm going to start with that value. And uh, that triggers a transition function, which in a way can call the send, uh, receive, and then send on the message buffer, which pushes that message. If we ask to receive, it pushes that message to, to, to the process, to the incoming action X, and so on and so forth. So now we have a nice way of reasoning about how the system might work. So we have this formalism in which we will try to uh, proof, uh, or at least understand the proof from the paper, um, right, within 15 minutes. So the, uh, so, uh, the way this paper is described is, uh, if you think about it, it's, they, go from, they go from the bottom-up approach. They, they, they are pushing at the very beginning a lot of definitions and constructs and formalisms, but once we get through, get through all of that, 
the proof should be straightforward. So there are, I think, two, three, or five more definitions that we have to just deal with, and then it's going to be easier. So just stay with me. Hopefully, you're still, you're still here. That's the, that's the beauty of it. You, there might be like 1,000 people or or just, just me and Lars. <laughs> so who knows? Anyway, there is a concept of internal state. So as you know, the internal state is just a summary of the input register, the output register, and all the internal state that the process may have. There is also a concept of initial state. So initial state is that internal state where everything is fixed, but only for the, uh, for the input register. So it means that the transition function is exactly the same. Initially, the output register is set to B and initial state, you, the only thing that you can tweak, the only thing you can change is the initial X, initial value with, with which the process starts its execution. <coughs> Sorry. Now, there is a second concept which is super important called configuration. So you can think of configuration intuitively, at least for now, as a snapshot of the whole system, of the whole system running in one particular moment of time. So configuration is a set of all internal states of all processes at the given moment, together with the content of the message buffer. So intuitively, initial configuration is set of all initial states and the message buffer is empty at the very beginning. So initial configuration is a configuration from which the process can start, uh, sorry, the, the, the algorithm can start its, its execution. Lastly, <coughs> or almost lastly, there is a concept of a step. So a step just brings us from one configuration to another. Hey, let's say our system is in one particular configuration, how we get to the next one. Well, given the model that we had, the formalism that we just introduced, you might, you might kind of have the intuition right now. We, we call the receive on the message buffer that potentially gives us some value M. It might be that, that zero token, right? The message might not be available. Depending on the internal state of the process and the value itself, we make a decision and that decision might be changing the state, but also sending some arbitrary number of messages to other processes. And a single step then, you, as you can see, by definition is completely determined by an, something we call an event. So event is just this tuple of process and message because that triggers the computation step. Now, sequence of steps, it's called a schedule. So if we have some configuration and from that configuration, you can apply a sequence of events and that will bring you to some other configuration. That sequence of events is called a schedule. And we sometimes say, we, we will be mentioning, we run the schedule. So it means we actually transition from one configuration to another using that schedule. Lastly, and this is all, I truly am saying this is the last definition, the, what it means for the process to be faulty, it means it takes a non-faulty process takes infinitely many steps. So even if the protocol stops, right, the process may still try to receive messages from the buffer. It will just keep on getting zero, 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 but it runs infinitely. And that it means for the process to be non-faulty, it's faulty otherwise. So it means it actually stops at some point. Um, Right, so uh, having that, the theorem, there is no way for the consensus protocol to be implemented uh, in spite of one fault. Okay, uh, we have 10 minutes for that. That's awesome because it's actually doable. Why? Because we took this, what, 30 minutes to understand all the fundings that are needed to understand how it works. But before we look at the proof of the theorem, there is one lemma lemma one we have to understand. That lemma is simple, uh, you will see in a moment, but it's essential to understand the proof. Like, like this is the crucial part. This is a building block really for the rest of the other two lemmas that are within the proof. So this lemma is, oh, look at it, it's so bizarre. Suppose that there, are so, there is some configuration C 
And there are two schedules, sigma one and sigma two, which go to configuration C1 and C2. And a set of processes in step of sigma one and sigma two are disjoint. Then sigma two can be applied to C1 and sigma one can be applied to C2. There is a, there is a back here, this should be a sigma one. Okay, so this is what, and then they both lead to the same configuration C3. Okay, great. I have absolutely no idea what that means, but fortunately, uh, there is a, a, a nice diagram that will allow us to, uh, to prove that. Um, but yeah, let, maybe let's look at the proof. The proof. Uh, the result follows at once from the system definitions in sigma 1 and sigma 2 do not interact. Okay, great. So this is one of those proofs as, you know, this is the exercise for the reader. Awesome. Luckily, there is a little nice diagram. So this is what they're actually telling us. Hey, if we have some configuration C, and there are some schedules sigma one and sigma two, but those schedules are disjoint in the processes. So this sigma one, let's say, talks to process P1 and P3, and this one talks to P2 and P4. They, though, those only process take uh, actions in those sequence of events. Then if, <coughs> if we then apply them in, in, in reverse order, so uh, then sigma two here and uh, sigma one over here, we will reach we will reach a, a same configuration. So this is basically what I said. Suppose you have a configuration, you have those two sigmas, you apply them and the, the steps are uh, disjoint, you apply them in, in reverse order and you will reach the same uh, conclusion. It's, it's really easy to see that just from this particular example, right? If we sigma one triggers P1 and P3 and sigma two triggers P2 and P4, uh, then we obviously by applying sigma two to C1 and sigma one to C2, we will reach the same uh, configuration C3. Um, so this is, this looks, if you look at over here, I hope it looks trivial, it makes sense. It's a, I don't know if a, if a proof from definition is, is a good proof, but I, I guess this, it's, it's uh, the only proof that we're gonna get. Now, as I said, this is important lemma for the rest of the proof. All right, so the proof of self, itself. Assume, so they have the, the, the theorem is no consensus protocol is totally correct in spite of one fault. Um, okay, so how they prove it? Well, they assume a contradiction. Uh, so they assume it is possible, and then they try to, in a sequence of two lemmas, they try to reach a contradiction. So they're saying, hey, let's assume that there is some consensus protocol P that actually reaches a uh, um, reaches a, a, an agreement uh, despite of, of a single fault of one process. Uh, and they try to reach a contradiction with that. So uh, before we look at those two lemmas, let's try to get maybe a, a, a intuitive within seven minutes. Uh, awesome. Um, let's try to get intuitive understanding of, what, of how the proof works. Before and, and, uh, and it's gonna be, I promise, hopefully, simple, but we need to understand one more, one more word, one more jargon uh, used in this paper. And that's called a, a bivalent, where a configuration can be bivalent or univalent. So imagine you have some configuration, right? And imagine that you, ha you, can, you have this ability to look into its future and you know if, if that particular configuration is completely deterministic, no matter what events you apply to it, no matter in what order, it will reach the same decision, either zero or one. If, if that particular configuration can only at some point reach only one decision, no matter what that is, but always consistently one, either zero or one, that we call it univalent. But if we are in configuration that still has to make some additional changes and additional you know, tweaks and messages needs to be exchanged between processes, and from that configuration, we might receive either zero or two, depending on you know, how the events will fly in the system, then we call this configuration bivalent. So this is like we were playing a little oracle where we talk about a, a whether configuration is bivalent or univalent. We know 
in the future, whether it will uh, has a possibility to reach two conclusions with different uh, runs, different schedules, or it will be deterministic and consistent and will always reach one. So how the proof works? Proof has actually two lemmas. The first lemma is saying, hey, I, can, I guarantee that no matter which protocol you will give me, there's always going to be one initial configuration, so one starting configuration when, there, when the results are not predeterministically uh, chosen. There is no way for you to at initial start of the protocol know, hey, I'm going to get to zero or I'm going to get to one. So there, there is at least one initial configuration that is bivalent. Okay, so that's the first thing that they prove. One configuration, at least initial configuration is bivalent. Second lemma, so the lemma number three in, in this paper is saying that if you are in some bivalent configuration, there, and then from that configuration, you can go to this number of other configurations, there's always going to be another one which is a bivalent. If we can prove those two things, we know we cannot reach a consensus. We always start with at least one bivalent initial configuration. And we, from the lemma number three, we know is know that if we are in some bivalent configuration, there's always another bivalent configuration reachable from it. It doesn't mean there are no ways of reaching a consensus. There are, obviously. But what it's saying is that there's always a computational step that makes the decision not there. It makes, a, un, makes the protocol kept on being undecidable, keep on trying to figure out what to do next. Okay, so the, 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 let's try to prove the lemma two. Bivalent, uh, so the, the lemma two says, P has at least one bivalent initial configuration. Okay, let's remind ourselves what is initial configuration. Initial configuration is a set of all initial states where the message and the message buffer is empty. What is an initial state? Initial state is for each process and thus for each conf initial configuration exactly the same for one thing, an input register, the X action, the input register X. So they all will differ only on that one particular thing, on the starting value that starts execution of each of the process. If that's the case, if that's the only thing that all the initial configurations differ, then it means that we can put on the sequence all the configuration. And by the way, the proof tries to reach contradiction. So proof is saying, I'm sorry, by the way, Lemma is saying that there is no bivalent initial configuration. The proof tries to say, let's imagine there is, that all initial configurations are univalent. And, and let's, let's reach a contradiction, okay? So we put all the con initial configuration in a sequence in such a way that each con two configurations that are neighbors to each other in that sequence, they only differ on a value X on a single process. So they might be exactly the same, but if you take two neighbors, they, they on, the only thing that they differ is the one will start with, uh, for example, for process, seven will start with value zero and the other one for process uh, seven starts with value one. All those configurations are univalent. I know I have like one minute, but I'm going to steal three minutes of your additional minutes of your time. Sorry, I have to. So if we have that, okay, we by, by definition we see, and we know that they have to, have to reach either zero or one, there will be a moment in that sequence where we'd have two configurations which are exactly the same. They only differ on one particular process, initial starting process. And let's say this process failed. So it's not taking part in the execution because it's possible in that proof. So that means if I apply the, some schedule where process, uh, that particular process is not taking part in the execution, I will apply it to C0, I reach value zero. And I apply the same schedule, the same sequence of events to C1, and I get a value one. In either way, I'm getting a bivalent configuration, which, uh, which proves that lemma. Okay? Now, <laughs> I'm gonna need three minutes for this. Uh, 
Lars, is it okay if I still five minutes? Is it, is it, is it? Yeah, cool? I, I think a few minutes should be fine. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So let's do this. So lemma three says, imagine that you have some configuration, which is bivalent. Okay. And there is some event, particular event E. Pick any event in that system that you can apply to that configuration. So it means that you can push that event on that configuration and that will give you a next computation step. Okay, so there's some event E, this is crucial. We can apply it to that C. Now let's imagine that double stroke C, so this, um, the, the one in the second sentence, is a set of all configurations that are reachable from C without applying E. So that means let's imagine, hey, I have this event, I could apply it to C, but let's say I will not. Let's say it just keeps on being in the message buffer and no one receives that particular event. Okay, so eventually, if I apply, so if double stroke C represents all configurations that are reachable without applying the E, all of them, whatever the number, how many of those are, if I finally apply that event to each and every one of them, that will give me a set of configurations, double stroke D, the lemma is saying that D will contain at least one bivalent configuration. So it means that if I pause the execution of event for some arbitrary long time, when I finally apply it, and I will get a, a, a set of different configurations, at least one of them will be, will be bivalent. So <clears throat> the way this is proved is by assuming a, a, a following. So let's say we have two configurations, C0 and C1, that are in that set uh, double stroke C. So C0 eventually will, uh, will reach a conclusion zero, C1 will eventually reach conclusion one. So that means if I apply event E C0, I will get D0 and E to C1, I will get D1 and uh, we are trying to, we are one more time trying to prove that lemma by, by, by assuming this is actually doable. That's like all the Ds will contain only univalent configuration and let's, let's, let's break it. Let's, let's reach a contradiction. Okay, so if I can apply that event E to C0 and I, apply, I can apply this event to E1, then they will reach con conclusion zero or one uh, accordingly. Now, uh, C1, C0 and C1 are considered neighbors. So they are considered configurations within double stroke C, which can be reached within a single step from one to each other. So I can go from C0 to, C, to C1 in a single step. And that step will be called E prime. Okay, so some different event than our original E. Now, E prime is a pre some P prime and message M prime. There are two, two possible cases. Either we reach C1 from C0 with the same process as the original P, so as the P here in that event. So either are, they are the same processes or they are different. Okay, let's see what happens if they are different. So we know I can go from C0 and apply it to E and I will reach some D0, fine. I also know that if I apply the same E to C1, I will reach D1. And I also know there is some E prime that allows me to go from C0 to C1. But now if those processes are different, they are then the schedules here are disjoint. And from a lemma, one, which we saw at the beginning, we know in that particular case, if you apply E prime and E or E and E prime, where those two schedules are disjoint, we should reach the same conclusion, which gives us a contradiction because we are reaching from a decision uh, D0 to D1. So that, that contradicts to the fact that D was supposed to be univalent, but we see it isn't. Okay, but maybe processes are exactly the same process. Let's say they are. Right, so now I'm reaching the end of my presentation. 
So you will see the lemma one apply here as well. So let's say I have some schedule in which process P, that process P and in pre prime are exactly the same. Let's say I have a schedule that goes directly to some state A, but in that schedule, process P takes no execution, takes no steps. Then from lemma one, I see if I, because those two here are disjoint, then if I go from C0 to, D, to and from applying E and then sigma, I can go up by applying sigma and E and I should reach the same value E0. Okay, this is good, fine. But then I apply exactly same understanding to, to this approach. Hey, remember we were able to go from C0 to C1 and some D1 by applying those two. This schedule over here is this join with that schedule because those two, two events take presence in the process P and then that sigma here by definition does not. So one more time by lemma two, we reach a same value E1. But now we just prove a contradiction because the A was supposed to give us a decision value. And from here we see it doesn't, it's still uh, bivalent and that, proves the theorem within one minute. Now what, right? Like, great, what, what's next? Well, the awesome concept about safety and lightness, which I have to skip by now because I run out of time, but the findings on the theorem uh, said one thing, it is impossible in a synchronous system where one thing may fail, um, reach a, a consistent, uh, reach a, a, a um, a uh, decision have a single protocol that will. On the other hand, there are models called synchronous model where there's like one global clock, which allows us to actually reach a consensus. So that spot a discussion and distributed uh, academia. Hey, if in synchronous models, we can reach a consensus and in a synchronous model, we can't, where's the sweet spot? What's the minimal set of synchronicity that we might have to actually reach a conclusion. And there were some findings that there is a concept of partial synchrony. So partial synchrony is a model, and that different, let's say partial synchrony models, but one particular in which I'm interested is, is the following. Let's say the model is following. There are some bounds in which processes work. Uh, for both the how much it takes to evaluate some, for the process to work, also how much it takes for the message to arrive. But there is an initial period in time where those do not apply. So like an initial period of, you know, uh, chaos. In that environment, it is possible to reach a consensus. And by the way, the consensus in the presence of partial synchrony gives uh, by Nancy Lynch and, and, uh, and, other, and others, allow, gives a very nice algorithm that does that, does that in that partial synchrony model, which is, this is really similar to the Paxos protocol. The only difference is they actually, they use automaton to prove their, um, their, uh, their consensus algorithm. I have to now really, really skip leave for really cool stuff. But uh, you might ask, okay, so is this scenario, uh, is this scenario applicable to real world? Yes, because in the real world, you don't really are in a scenario where you constantly messages are dropped, like you never know what will happen. You can assume some synchrony. If from time to time, things are not synchronous, as long as your protocol stays safe, as long as it doesn't gives you a contradicting results, you're fine, you're actually fine. And so that partial synchrony model can be applied to real world. And as, as we know, there are some implementation of Paxos. By the way, Paxos itself, I have to finish, right? Pablo, could you wrap up, please? Wrap up, yeah, okay. So wrapping things up, um, some papers on it. Um, so, this is the, the single tweet. When people bring out FLP with sense of dread, I tell them it's a formalization of the fact that two people are walking towards each other in the same sidewalk, sidewalk and in theory could be stuck going side to side forever and then becomes less intimidating. So even though scenarios of that like are theoretically possible, 
we figured out ways to you know overcome them. You know, some dictators maybe have a wrong idea how to do that. Anyway, before we go really, really quickly, I want to thank Sully for creating this conference. It's really, really awesome to, in, especially in those current times. In case you want to understand how things are bad, Amazon just sold out all the podcast microphones uh, yesterday. So that's how things are bad, and we need conferences like that. Thank you very much, Sully, for stealing your time.